Modern weapons are guided electronically. Fired electronically, exploded electronically. Modern warfare has developed an insatiable appetite for electronics. With the Korean War came shortages. Shortages in electronic production plants. Unmistakable evidence that we must radically improve production methods to assure the future security of our country. Present systems, even with the advanced techniques shown here, involve tedious hand assembly. And component parts are a problem. Resistors and capacitors were production bottlenecks during World War II. The answer to speeding up production and avoiding component supply bottlenecks most logically will be found in a mechanized system. This means, of course, drastic changes, a new basic approach. Fortunately, electronics is a young industry, less than 30 years old, flexible, growing rapidly. It constantly develops amazing new products, both civilian and military. The Navy, at the outbreak of war in Korea, knew that if a world war exploded, it might require 10 times the electronics equipment used during World War II. Shortages were critical even at that time. Knowing of government research currently in progress, the Navy went to the National Bureau of Standards. The Bureau assigned engineers and scientists to the research. The first step called for developing a common denominator for an electronic production system and testing it. The building block principle appeared to offer the best possibilities. With a system developed acceptable to the Navy, Bureau engineers set about designing production machines. The work was codenamed Project Tinker Toy. This common denominator, along with other components of the system, was put through rigid testing. Exposure to salt spray, low frequency vibration, high frequency vibration, centrifugal force. Also, extreme humidity, temperature, and pressure. And shock. In all these tests, Tinker Toy products came through as well or better than conventional counterparts. Let an engineer from the National Bureau of Standards explain the system developed under Project Tinker Toy, sometimes referred to as Modutronics. The basic problem as we saw it, finding a solution to the mechanization of production of electronic equipment, was to fulfill two specific requirements. First, we needed to retain the flexibility of circuit application, which is characteristic of the conventional assembly method. Second, we needed to add a marked degree of standardization and uniformity to permit the simple repetitive operations characteristic of mechanized assembly. The approach which we have used is an embodiment of the building block principle or modular construction. We call this approach the modular assembly method. Let me describe the system by showing you its application in a typical electronic product. This is the electronic portion of an expendable piece of gear required in large quantities in the case of a national emergency. It is typical of 
many applications using conventional construction wherein individual components or piece parts are hand assemble to the metal cake tin type of construction such as illustrated here. For purposes of comparison, we have a similar unit using modular construction with the same circuit design and same component arrangement, equivalent performance and similar characteristics with respect to weight and size are readily obtained. You will note that the machined assemble modules replace almost entirely the hand assemble components and individual piece parts so characteristic of conventional construction. The equipment you've just seen demonstrates a typical application of the modular design system. This chart shows the development of a module from its component parts, tube sockets, resistors, and capacitors, which are in turn developed from the common denominator of the system, a bare ceramic wafer, which after suitable processing and testing can be joined with 12 conductors in such a manner as to complete the circuit and to produce a typical module. The proof of the system has been accomplished through the operation of a large scale pallet production facility. This scale model depicts the general arrangement of the pallet production facility. The main assembly line shown in the background requires the assistance of other machines to pre-process the raw materials. This facility is a ceramic facility where the wafers and ceramic capacitor dielectrics are formed. In the ceramic section, wafers and ceramic capacitor dielectrics are produced from raw materials, allowing a completely controlled process from raw materials to end products. With water added, the material is milled thoroughly, then pumped into a filter press. The press removes excess moisture, leaving the material in the form of dry cakes. These ceramic processes refine the powder, producing chemically clean, uniform particles of desired sizes. Liquid binders and water are added to achieve desired consistency. The bulk material is then granulated to a consistency similar to cornmeal. A sifter automatically separates the different size particles. Various sizes are then recombined in proper ratio completing the refining process. In this forming press, the ceramic powder is die stamped under high pressure to form the basic wafers. Automatic units like this loading machine reduce manpower requirements. Unfired wafers are sent through an automatic continuous electric firing furnace where close temperature control assures the quality of the ceramic product. After furnace firing, a sample wafer is inspected for porosity under high pressure. All wafers are checked automatically for accurate size in a wafer gauger. Any that are off size are rejected. Now we're ready to go into the main production line. The first machine is the wafer notch painter. The feeder on the notch painter is a standard vibratory type used throughout the line. Wafers dumped into the center are moved up a spiral ramp by vibration. Sliding down from the feeder, wafers are picked up by a chain carriage for movement through the painting station. Four sets of wheels rotating in a silver paint bath 
Engage wafer notches and leave a thin deposit of silver. The three side walls of each notch have received silver paint for future mating with conductive material. Painted wafers then pass under drying elements. The second operation is performed by the wafer printer. Here, wafers receive basic electrical patterns. They are fed into as many as six channels, permitting simultaneous printing of up to six different circuit patterns. Plant personnel serve only to keep machines running smoothly and to transport materials between machines. These are the standard vibratory feeders with specially built orienting units attached on top. There are eight possible wafer positions, four edges, two sides. The smallest notch serves as a guide for orienting. When correctly positioned, wafers drop through and enter the machine. By continuous quarter turns and flop overs, each wafer eventually reaches its proper orientation and falls through. From the feeders, they slide down discharge chutes. Flow is controlled by photoelectric cells and special release mechanisms. The machine is now operating at a rate of 6,000 wafers per hour. Oscillating rubber squeegees apply silver paint through a screen pattern stencil. By merely changing printing stencils, the production line can be switched quickly to making different modules for entirely new products. The old pattern is removed as a unit and replaced by the new pattern, as called for on the modular worksheet. This coding system controls all processes on the line. With the first side printed, wafers pass through an electric drying oven and are turned over for printing the other side. One line of wafers across the channels constitutes components for one module. After the second side is printed and oven dried, wafers go through an electric firing furnace. They now bear completed patterns with metallized notches connected to electrical areas on one or both surfaces. In the firing furnace, silver patterns were fused into the ceramic material. Wafers fall into canisters for transporting to the next machine. Canisters are identified by control cards. A code system of punched holes indicates circuit patterns for production and for testing control. Throughout the system, a 100% production test is made automatically after each major production step. Here, the wafer pattern tester checks pattern shape and electrical qualities of each wafer. The coded punch cards automatically set up appropriate pattern configurations and tabulators record production quantities, indicating wafers accepted or rejected. The Tinker Toy system uses specially designed tape resistors. A carbon and resin ink of desired resistance formula is prepared for application to asbestos-based tape. The base tape revolves in a spraying booth where resistor ink is sprayed on. Controlled spraying permits determining resistor values to a half a dozen ohms. Heat lamps dry the ink. After tape has been slit into various size rolls and marked, it is placed in storage at low temperature. This is the resistor tape applicator. It attaches as many as four resistor tapes to the pre-printed and tested wafer patterns. 
The resistor tapes have been cut and placed on the silver electrode areas on one or both sides and are now connected to notches. However, they are not finished resistors until properly cured by heat. They are fed into a curing oven where controlled heat establishes resistance quality. After resistors have been heat cured, they are put through a notch tinner. Here, the notched portions pass through a flux solution and a molten solder bath. This is another 100% production test, automatically checking resistors. Wafers feed into a turntable, where as many as four resistors per wafer may be tested for individual specifications. Defective resistors are rejected automatically. Resistors are further checked in load life test ovens. Oven trays connect electrically to a control panel. Various electrical loads may be imposed upon the resistors by this control panel, while at the same time, automatic test equipment records any variations in resistor values. Meanwhile, capacitors are being produced. A forming press stamps them into shape from powder. Capacitors are then given the same processing we saw applied to basic wafers with ceramic furnace firing and main line metallization. Here are the capacitors after the silver pattern printing process. They are ready for tinning and subsequent mounting onto capacitor wafers. This is the tinning machine. Capacitors move through a flux solution, then through molten solder tin. Capacitor wafers are tinned in a companion machine. The tinning process is identical. After tinning, capacitor wafers look like this. They now go to the capacitor assembler. Wafers and capacitors are fed in by vibratory feeders. A wafer falls into a traveling carrier. Then a slave unit is deposited on top of the wafer. The slave unit properly positions the capacitors as many as four to the wafer in preparation for assembly. Components are welded together by induction heat coils which melt and fuse metallic surfaces. This machine then deposits conductive tin in wafer notches. Finished capacitor wafers go through an automatic testing machine. Again, this is a 100% production check. They are tested for capacitor value and for voltage breakdown or excessive leakage currents under overload conditions. In tube socket production, a punch press stamps out socket connectors. Progressive dies convert a flat metal strip rapidly into completed socket connectors in a continuous operation. The connectors will be silver plated prior to assembly. This is the tube socket assembler. Here, connectors are entering the machine. Other parts are fed in at the same time through individual feeders. Tube socket parts consist of a wafer, one eyelet, the socket body, and seven or nine connectors. Connectors are cut off as needed in this die section and inserted into socket bodies. 
The wafer is added and joined to the socket body by insertion and clamping of the eyelet. Assembled tube sockets are unloaded and deposited in a parts carrier. On the flow chart, we are now at the point in production where manufacturing of module components is complete. Tube sockets, resistors, capacitors, all are ready for assembly into modules. One machine, the module assembler, does the job. Pre-tested components are fed in by a method similar to that used on the wafer pattern printer. From individual feeders, components move down to a loading station where they fall into proper position for assembly. Different components can be combined to assemble modules of any circuit desired. Traveling fixtures move components to the first soldering station. As many as six wires, three to a side, are fed out and pressed into the wafer notches. Automatic soldering irons move in and fuse the wires in place. The traveling fixture then rotates a quarter turn, positioning the module for application of the remaining six wires. On a six wafer module, this machine automatically solders 72 connections, 36 at each station. With 12 riser wires soldered into place, assembly is complete. Notice the alignment of the notches. A wire cutting machine clips module riser wires automatically to proper lengths for any desired circuit design. Riser wires serve as electrical conductors as well as mechanical supports. In this typical module, a small wire segment has been clipped out to prevent conduction at that point. Here's a variation of the standard module, with one wafer replaced by a conventional choke coil. All completed modules are checked in this testing machine. Pre-punched identification cards control the test. A master module inside this container serves as a testing standard. The machines you have just seen have been used to prove the feasibility of mechanized production of electronic equipment using the modular design system. There is one stage of the process which has not been completed as this film is being made. This machine will assemble modules to base plates to form final functional units. The base plates required by this machine will be produced in a separate facility. Circuit patterns are screen printed on the metal surface of thin plates of metal plastic laminates. They are then dried in an oven, placed in an etching machine where chemicals eat away areas where conduction is not desired. 
These base plates then are rinsed and thoroughly washed to remove the chemicals. Onto this base plate, the machine will affix the necessary modules required for the electronic task the equipment must perform. It will attach a top plate and vacuum tubes, transistors, or other parts to complete the plate assembly. This base plate assembly may be equipped with hardware, plugs, and connectors so that a number of similar units may be readily joined to accomplish the complex job of a complete piece of electronic equipment. You have seen the development of an electronics production system, wherein all components conform to a common modular design, allowing production to be mechanized, yet versatile, lending itself to dual purpose plant operation and giving high speed, high volume, low cost production. In this system, maintenance can be as simple as replacing this low cost modular subassembly as a unit, saving valuable man hours. The Navy is confident that this new system will undergo improvement and further development in the hands of the electronics industry to ensure rapid, efficient conversion in the event of any future mobilization.